The so-called left's favorite billionaire, Mark Cuban, going after Silicon Valley for supporting former President Trump. Crypto-backed super PACs also supporting Republican candidates. The group defending American jobs, spending $12 million on GOP Ohio Senate candidate Bernie Moreno, hoping to flip the Senate to Republicans. A new piece in The Wall Street Journal, meanwhile, claims that many CEOs are conflicted on who is better for business, Donald Trump or Kamala Harris. I think it's pretty obvious. Joining me now is eight VC managing partner and Palantir co-founder, Joe Lonsdale. Joe, great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning. Let me kick it off with that Mark Cuban soundbite. What did you make of Cuban's attack on Silicon Valley? He's mad that Silicon Valley, is, uh, many there are supporting Trump. You know, I think Mark Cuban, you know, he has his own views and he truly doesn't like Donald Trump as president. I think what you're seeing is you've gone from almost none of Silicon Valley supporting Trump uh, in 2016, uh, a little bit more in 2020. And now I'd say probably half of the leaders I know uh, who are, you know, builders in business are realizing, wait a second, there's this kind of like crazy, dangerous, far left radical stream in our society that's going to break everything. It's going to stop us from being builders. And we, we need to support the side that's going to let our civilization thrive. Yeah, that's exactly right. And Trump has been very clear on an agenda of, you know, tapping into the capacity of energy in America, deregulating, uh, extending the tax cuts and, and using tariffs for not just economic growth, but but uh, national security. That's the one area that is debatable, I guess, and from, from some of these globalists. But we don't know what Kamala Harris will do. She hasn't articulated well, a plan. Well, you know, that, that's yeah. Mark Cuban's argument, Maria. And I'm going to push back on that because I've been watching her for 20 years. And I think we, we've seen that she does not know how to ever push back on the far left. She raised her hand with Bernie Sanders to get rid of, you know, health insurance. She said she'd end the filibuster to get the Green New Deal passed. I mean, we could all say we don't know what she's that's going true. to do. You're right. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, well, she hasn't put out her policies yet. And yet people don't just transform overnight. Like she is overseeing this invasion of our border. You know, she, she, she has a weaker foreign policy people around her who are writing op-eds with Iranian spies who are not pushing back on Latin American socialists. You know, she's not going to ever push back on the bureaucracies or the corrupt NGOs that ruin California that her party's giving money to in D.C. These are clear policies. She's been on the wrong side of for 20 years. So I think it's I think it's really tough to say we don't know what she's going to do. You know? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, you are spot on. The issue is she hasn't articulated her quote unquote platform, but we know what she's done in the past. She said there's no question I want Medicare for all. She said there's no question uh, that, um, you know, we're going to take away guns, buy back guns. Uh, she said there's no question that she uh, wants the uh, green energy deal moving forward. And that's where the spending was in the last four years that brought us inflation. It's it, there's massive inflation that hurts the working class. Uh, she can try to get our guns, but I live in Texas. We're not, you know, <laughs> that's not what we do around here. <laughs> Plenty of fallout, meanwhile, from President Trump's interview with Elon Musk. What'd you make of that? I mean, now the United Auto Workers filing federal labor charges against both Musk and Trump, claiming that their comments about strikes threatened and intimidated workers. Turns out that the European Union official who sent that letter to Elon Musk threatening legal consequences if he didn't censor any, quote, harmful content and, quote, disinformation from the interview, did not have permission from the European Union Commission to send the letter. So we're showing you the letter on Are screen. these regulators? Yeah. Can you believe this? The, the, the commission EU said that the timing the and the wording world. of the letter were neither coordinated or agreed upon with the president or the commissioners, Joe. But how dare this guy from the EU send this letter to Elon Musk threatening him to censor Trump? The, the stuff that's going on right now, Maria, in the UK and the EU, it's, it's disgusting. There's this like very illiberal very left authoritarianism. It's making the right in America question NATO and question our alliance, which I am very sad to say because, you know, the UK was the birth of liberty in the West, and the EU has been such an important part of our civilization. And it's just to threaten, to try to force to silence and censor things going on in the US. And the fact, of course, this administration is totally silent in response, it's just absolutely disgusting. But, you know, you know this conversation I thought was great. Uh, when Elon and Trump get together and speak like this, you can no longer just paint him as a crazy fascist if you can actually listen to him, hear what he says. I think the left media really doesn't like it when people can platform people, can put them out there and can go around them. And that, that's what Elon's doing. But I mean, how about these large tech companies that are totally willing to, you know, go along the narrative, go along the line of, of, of this administration and, and censor individuals? They've been doing it for you know, now um, so, so many years. You know, Maria, the, the Marxism, the authoritarian right. threat that Reagan warned us about that's really dark, 
didn't go away. It, it shifted. It changed into pernicious form. It conquered a lot of our media, conquered our universities, uh, conquered a lot of our government departments, and, and you see it taking over big tech after the universities as well. And it's very, very scary what this authoritarian ideology will do, and I, we're all at war against it right now on the right, and we have to stop it. Terrible. Do you think Trump would put Elon in his cabinet? I don't know if he'd be in the cabinet. Mm. I think I think Elon's a very busy guy, but yeah. I think he'd be very involved in yeah. making sure to help fix our government. There's a lot of really broken things to to take care of, and I think Elon would be there with Vivek Ramaswamy and with others, and there'd be a lot of competent people, and I'd hopefully be helping too, Maria, and because I love, we need to step up. We I, need to fix a lot of things. I love your work because you are such a patriot, and you and you show that through and through, even through your your investing. I want to get your take on how you invest in defense and, and, and defense technology investments, particularly on this report that we've been talking about from the Defense National Council, which basically talked about a potential conflict between the United States and uh, China and Russia. And this report by the Commission on the National Defense Strategy finds that the U.S. could lose a conflict with China and Russia in a global war unless significant changes are made to our national defense strategy, Joe. W what's your take on our national defense strategy, the, f the fact that we're not investing the, the money and, and uh, expertise in our military the way we were? This is very concerning as China ramps up its money into its own military. You know, you know what's interesting, Maria, is it's not just about how much money, because you can spend money in a way where things cost 100 times more than they, they should, and that's what we're doing, is a lot of the money goes to these legacy places. They're not the best engineers in the world, not the best talent, and only a very tiny fraction of our defense spending goes into the areas that actually terrify our enemies, that actually produce, for example, Serotic is ramping up very quickly for the Navy. It's the latest new defense unicorn that I helped found with some amazing former Navy SEALs and great talent here in Texas, and this company is able to build you know, hundreds and then thousands of small autonomous weaponized vessels for the same cost as one large ship. And it turns out that in a battle, you're going to want thousands of these things versus one uh, if you want to defeat your enemies. Since there's just a lot of ways we're not spending money as well as we could. And, you know, some of the admirals and the generals get it, and we're pushing as hard as we can in the right direction. But it's a big fight between the new innovators and the legacy primes. And that, that's what we're dealing with. So, I mean, I saw the piece on Palmer Lucky the other day. Admiral Industries have done incredibly well as well in terms of drone technology. Yeah. Where would you and, say and, is... And, is a leader in multiple key new areas. You know, he started Andrew with uh, three of my former Palantir colleagues. I and I was an early investor there as well. They're, they're doing a really important work as a new prime for the U.S. And Palmer's an amazing American. I know. I went there and I saw his warehouse of drones, and it was quite impressive. Do you think that's where the latest technology with regard to defense is? It, is it in drone technology? Is it something else that I don't know about? Where, well, it's, where it's, specifically? It's in, it's in swarms of what's called a tritable mass. And so rather than spend, like, billions of dollars on something that China could just wipe out with a hypersonic missile, you want to build hundreds or thousands of them, and you want to make them smart. And then you want to have other new technologies. For example, Epris, our company, can use electromagnetic radiation, like a pulse, to turn off these kind of drones, to turn off these swarms from miles away. So oh, you, wow. you both need to have a lot of these things that are smart, and then you need new ways of turning them off. And it's, it's, it's a whole different battlefield out there with electronic warfare and with everything else going on. I love it, Joe. All right, let me get your take on crypto. There's a new report warning that Kamala Harris aim, aims to maintain the Biden administration's crypto crackdown. Uh, Kamala has been reportedly working with two former Biden economic advisors who heavily opposed a bill that would have brought stable coins within the same regulatory framework that governed traditional financial services companies. Joe, where do you see crypto going in terms of the regulatory environment I guess it really depends on November 5th, doesn't it? Yeah, it really depends who wins. Listen, crypto is on a pro-liberty side. All over the world, where there's crackdowns from authoritarians, the only way to get your money out and the only way to kind of move things around in those countries with the authoritarians can't control is with crypto. Crypto is a great outlet if the government does major inflation, destroys things. So, so, so people who are naturally authoritarian, they're going to be against crypto. And you saw, you see Gary Gensler running the SEC right now. Uh, you know, he met with people who donated to the left. He's very against the crypto guys. He's being totally arbitrary and ridiculous against them. And you're seeing a lot of my friends in crypto, uh, whether it's the Winklevoss twins, whether it's other guys behind the scenes, step up and donate to Trump, donate to the right now. In a way, it's really amazing because they're realizing, wait a second, if these authoritarians win, they're going to crush us. Yeah. And so, so this is a huge issue for the country. Big issue. All right, Joe, great to get uh, your take on all of that. We so appreciate your time this morning.